and who's been not only instrumental in changing my life, my family life, but who has, a, I mean, just a compassion to love on our people. Family, we don't have a lot of people that look like us that's out here for free. I'm going to keep saying that. Yes. Yes. Teaching and coming back and pouring into our people like this. So what I want y'all to do, I need it to be so loud that the cars are rattling on the way crossing the street on top of Give it up for my bro, King J. <laughs> man, I appreciate you guys for coming out just to, just to hear some words. Um, as I, I got two black-owned brands on. I got to shout them out both. Bro. I came here and, and doing, uh, what's this called? Doing real good. My brother out of Houston gave us this shirt. I love this shirt. This got me going through my day. And then I, I had to switch like black Batman, black Superman, young, young Malcolm. And I threw my man, my brother, uh, uh, Demetrius from Black Money Matters, threw on our custom Landlord Gang shirt. So we represent Landlord Gang. Custom Landlord? Gang. What's that? I need some of that. And while we're here, really, is, especially on this weekend, it's Father's Day weekend, it's great to see so many of you out here with your... Well, we are renaming our children. We, we, we're rebranding our children in our community. Heirs. That's right, that's right. Well, what they call it again? Heirs. Heirs. What they call it again? Heirs. What they call it again? Heirs. What they call it again? Heirs. These are our heirs. Sir. This is a family wealth class. This is an intergenerational family wealth class. This ain't just no house flipping, wholesaling, gotta fix my credit, on, get no. by, crump snatching. <laughs> <laughs> This is a family wealth class, intergenerational wealth. Intergenerational wealth is different than generational wealth. See, generational wealth means one generation. I'm talking about how we set up our heirs. Everybody say heirs. Heirs. I'm talking about how we set up our heirs and our heirs' heirs and our heirs' heirs' heirs by the work that we do today. And that's really what's missing in our community in regards to bridging the wealth gap is that we so, we're so intentional, we're so focused on what we are stopping, stopping the bleeding today, we're putting no seed in the future or in the seeds in the ground for our future harvest. And I understand, and, and I come from a community in New Jersey where I come from below the poverty line, I, I come from struggle, from obstacles, it was 11th grade high school dropout. Caught my first felony at 18 years old, facing three years of life in prison, served two and a half years in prison, in seven different prisons. I'm a former three-time felon, I have no college education. But yet I manage a multi-million dollar enterprise. That's right! Tens of millions of business and real estate assets. And I'm saying all that to say because I do want to inspire and motivate some of us today because I know it's those obstacles yeah, and those roadblocks and those barriers, those there's really a mental and emotional barriers we put up that say that we can't do because I can't because I, I dropped out of high school. I can't because I'm a single mom. I can't because I'm a felon. I can't because I come out of this community. And we tell ourselves all these cans, but before we got to the T and can, we had to get through can. Uh-oh. Yes, and there has to be some motivation for us to get through these obstacles, and I was actually really beat up this week, right? Like, I'm human like the rest of us, and I go through drama like the rest of us, and, and as an entrepreneur and someone that manages multiple enterprises and is focusing on my heirs and, and my wife and our family and our community and pouring in and on the middle of a 10-city tour, and now got extended to like five more cities now, or 15 cities. And so through all this work, I go through stresses and drama and, and emotional and spiritual, and the devil be trying to beat me up too. I got people that I took off the street, people that I took off dead-end opportunities and put them into my organization, bought them their first suit, who now is trying to double back after they left the organization and take our customers and our products and stealing from the organization. I, I go through that too. And on this entrepreneurial journey, on this journey towards life, the whole point is that we got to accept and we got to embrace and we got to endure all those obstacles. 
no matter what it is that we come from. And the motivation for that, the reason for that is because if we, if we bail out and we bow out and we don't put any focus on creating something for our heirs or we just get real selfish about blowing money fast right now for us or spending it right now and hope to get it right back for us <laughs> and hustle for our first name and not hustle for our last name, that's the kind of big homies we're going to be. That's the kind of mom and dad and community members we're going to be. We're going to continue to, to fail, to live in poverty, to live in blighted communities, and then blame them and they for why they ain't do for us what we could have did for ourselves. Yeah. Come on, now. Right. What I'm saying is, if we don't focus and get on our good foot, and we don't get motivated by our legacies, and stop focusing on just right now and temporary satisfaction and not delaying the, the gratitude, if we don't delay it, and we don't put something in the ground, in the soil for later, if we don't think about our heirs, they're going to be in the same situations that we were in, that we grew up in, facing the same obstacle that's frustrating you today. Same you frustrated time. by that, that good old corporate trap, that nine to five trap. Man. You frustrated by that college trap, that corner trap, that correctional trap, that cultural trap. So what I'm saying and what we're we'll teaching today is not just to motivate and inspire you. What I'm saying is that I've come through uh, amazing journey, amazing testimony. God gave me amazing endurance. One of my heirs, my daughter is standing before you right now. She probably doesn't like when I do this too much, but I'm proud of her. College student here in St. Louis. What? Yeah. All right, all right. Hometown girl. That's right. But, I, but she was born, I was an 18 year old dad. Not only was I an 18 year old dad, I was an 18 year old dad on a top bunk in an upstate New York prison when she was born. Uh oh. I told her my first time seeing her was on a visiting room floor. She spent nights in trap houses and hotels while I backed up my inventory from my former career as a street entrepreneur. <laughs> specifically a street pharmacist. <laughs> but now I can, because of the sacrifices I made, because of the motivation that she gave me, she's why I left the corner of Tinton Springfield in North New Jersey in 2005. Where I made a decision to ask myself, now mind you, your trap might have been different than my trap. So as I tell my story, I want you to think about your trap. That thing that's holding you back is not motivating you enough to make the decisions that you have to make for you and your heirs, and your heirs' heirs, what we call our legacy. So in 2005, 25-year-old Jay was on the corner of 10th and Springfield as a three-time felon who just served two and a half years in prison, just completed an 18-month intense supervision parole program, left that parole program, went back to the streets for three more years, just nearly beat another trafficking charge. And 25-year-old Jay had to look around as he's, as he's serving in his corner and supplying his corner with heroin and is hustling with gangbangers and slayers, had to ask himself, well, Jay, where are you going to be when you're 30? Right now, your heir is seven years old, but where are you going to be by the time she's 12? Where are you going to be when you're 30, Jay? And I only could imagine two things. You know what that was? Dead or in jail. Say it again. Dead or in jail. Say it with your chest. Dead or in jail. Dead or in jail. I had enough emotional intelligence at 25 years old. I was committed to the game. I started trapping at 15. It was getting ready to die trying. Every time I came, I went through prison and came home from prison. Prison never reformed me. Prison was criminal school. I went to jail, made new connects, made new friends, and made new routes. <laughs> Came home from prison right back to it, right to the bag. Was committed to that until 25 years old. Nearly 14, 15 years ago, I had to ask myself a real question, like old homeboy. Like, where are you going to be hustling in these streets of North, trafficking in Baltimore, running your routes? And I only could picture myself in a tan prison suit behind green bars or my head leaking on a corner. That was my real picture. So I try to shake it off, like, nah, 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 I got this. But see, at 17 years old, I had committed that I was going to be rich in the game. I was going to be one of the, the kings of the game. 
I committed to the trap. So I'm like, now nah, I, I know I can see a better way out. Cause I, I believed it. Then I got still only picture myself dead or in jail. So then the challenge was, well, what are you going to do next? If you know this is a dead end trap, right? Just like for those of us who are in a nine to five trap, the corporate trap, we call it. If you know that corporate trap is not providing a way for you to create wealth and legacy, which I'm going to explain to you in a second what wealth and legacy is. But if you know that trap, or just aimlessly going to college with just your eyes asleep, your eyes closed. You're just going to school because they told you to. You don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> and you don't have no real career, no real they told you to. No plan for assets, no plan for abundance. If you're caught in that trap, you've got to really ask yourself, well, what am I going to do differently to change my circumstance? So for me, I got introduced to the mortgage industry and real estate in 2002 while I was on parole. And so I had to ask myself, I said, you know, that mortgage thing wasn't too bad. This real estate thing is not too bad. My mom bought a property in the uh, year, I think, 2000. Yeah, 2000. And by 2004, sold that property, made a hundred grand profit. Woo! In three years with no renovations. And all we did was live there. <laughs> so I said, man, she cashed out a hundred. Then I remember I was in mortgages, I made some money. So I said, well, what would happen if I took all my energy, all my tenacity, all my focus, all my hustle... And I put it into another inner, to another place, another vehicle, other than the streets I've tried for 10 years now that have got me a couple cars, I had a couple watches, I had a couple dollars, but had my life and my freedom and my daughter's future in jeopardy forever. Because I couldn't take my energy and do nothing else. But I called myself a hustler. But I thought a hustler could hustle anything. A drug dealer can only sell drugs. I'm going to say it again. A uh, true hustler goes with anything. Anything. That's facts. Only a drug dealer can sell drugs. And so I walked away that day. I just said, you know what? Give me three weeks. I'll be right back. Give me two more flips. Give me another month. I knew what my future was headed for. That day, I still had product left. I gave it away. I still had my trap phone. I broke it. I still had connects. I severed ties. And so I will take my energy full steam into real estate. Full steam in the mortgages. Went and got my mortgage license. Went and got my real estate license. Went and bought my first two-family property, 100% financing. Mm. Got my first duplex. And I went full steam into real estate from off the corner. Not knowing much of what I was doing. Not having half the game that I give y'all. But I knew that my alternative was not attractive to me. My alternative was no longer... I didn't have to drive. It, 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 it was no, there was no burn there. There was no burning desire for the alternative. And so I got into real estate full time. Only made twenty five hundred dollars my first nine months. Mm. Was ready to quit the game. All this real estate, dumb bull. See, I knew I should stay in trap. <laughs> but then that ninth month, I was gonna quit. I closed seven deals and made thirteen thousand. Next month made thirty thousand. Four months later made ninety-four thousand. All from endurance, trusting my hustle, and pouring into the game. And less than three years later, made my first million in real estate, became a multi-millionaire, national icon, and national influencer in the game. Till now, I stand before you, nearly fifteen years later. As the CEO and founder of the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. All right. Woo! If y'all don't know, that's the first black-owned real estate crowdfund in American history. Yeah. Woo! The first black-owned real estate crowdfund in the history of the United States of America. Yeah! building up that organization, the millions of assets under management that we have, also founded the J. Morrison Academy, which sponsors this tour, and under the J. Morrison Academy, I built that organization in the last five years to Inc. 500's number 588 fastest growing company in the country. Wow. Number 13 fastest growing educational companies. This is the former trapper. This is the former dope boy. 
This is the former three time felon. This is the former wit kid, welfare kid, the free lunch kid. But I took that burning desire and that drive into the real estate industry. I put my head down and I focused and I learned the business. Sir. See, that's what I did, which money of us don't take the time to do. I, I, I learned the business. Back up. The same way I learned it in the trap. The same way I understood how the routes worked in the trap, how we bagged up. How it was one for 20, two for 35, three for 50, four for 70, six for 100. I ain't forget. <laughs> but I learned the game. When I got into real estate and entrepreneurship, I put that same kind of energy and learned to game. The same way I know LTVs, ARVs, points, purchase ratios, cap rates, how to find the ROI. 1031 tax exchange, opportunity zone funds. I learned the game, creating business finance, syndicating deals, underwriting deals. I learned the game. So what happens in our community, what I believe is that the wealthy, the, the wealthiest corporations, the system, intentionally did not tell us what I'm going to teach you today is a class that we all could have learned in ninth grade. Mm. What I'm going to teach you today is a class that we all could have learned in seventh grade. Yeah, we all could have learned in Sunday school. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm going to teach you today about building family wealth is going to be so lame in terms, so broken down, so, so simple, so relatable. You're going to be like, damn, man, we could have been doing this. <laughs> but the goal is, again, I don't believe in just blaming others and not doing for myself what I can do for myself. So we didn't have the proper curriculum to teach us legacy and family wealth, so we created our own school and gave us our own curriculum. If we didn't have an economic vehicle for us to be able to invest together and buy back the block, we created our own fund. Where we all can have ownership and all participate in the profits and get a preferred return and have equity in one company. The Tulsa Real Estate Fund has over 9,400 partners from around the world. 9,400 partners that invested a minimum of $500 to be in position for an 8% preferred return and their future 50% of their share of the profits. As owners, as equity owners and partners in this historic fund. That's solution driven. So now we all have to be, again, everything you hear today is not going to matter as much to your family, your heirs, if you don't approach it with some level of intensity and burning desire. So I was saying, I was beat up this week. I went to my brother Mike's house here in St. Louis. He flicking through my YouTube, showed me some of the videos I've been watching. And we went back three years ago to an old video I did on a saying I have called Outwork the Work. Oh, everybody say, I'll work the work. I'll work, work the work. work. No, you got to say a little more energy in that. Say, I'll work the work. I'll work the work. And so, yeah, fool. <laughs> I'll work the work, fool. That's how I used to say it. So I'm watching this video, and I allow myself to kind of mentor myself. Mm. And allow myself to minister to myself and teach to myself. Because what I'll work the work was about was everything I was going through this week. I'll work the work was the hell with your excuses. To hell with your obstacles, to hell with your journey. No matter how big that plate is in front of you, no matter how much that workload is, no matter how much your family is set behind, you gotta outwork the work, fool. Ain't no choice in the matter. And part of that outwork the work formula was uh, 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 an acronym I had called BBBP. Three B's and a P. The first B was having a burning desire. The second B was having big, bodacious goals. Like having some goals that, like coming from a three-time felon from a high school dropout to being the CEO of the first black real estate crowdfunding in the history of America. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Some goals that you think are impossible, something to chase, and having a burning desire behind it. But then outside of having the, the burning desire and the big bodacious goals, you've got to be intentional about those goals. Somebody tell me what intentional means, please. Say it again. On purpose. Say it again. On purpose. It again. On purpose. Intentional means on purpose. And then after you have a burning desire, 
You have big, bodacious goals. Like, I'm going to take my family from where they're at right now to leave my heirs at least $10 million in assets. Them kind of goals. Like, some now your friends are like, man, you crazy. Them kind of goals. Now you set them kind of goals with a burning desire because your legacy motivates you, your heirs motivate you, your last name motivates you. Then you're intentional about it, you do it on purpose. And then the last is the P. You gotta persist. Mm. You gotta endure. Just cause you said it and you hype and you feeling it today, don't mean that you get smacked down and beat up later. You know it. With all I accomplished, even as a three-time author, two-time best-selling author, and all of my business resume, I still fell on financial hardships, still fell on personal hardships. Life still happens. I filed a 2016 Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which just discharged last year, wow. early this year. Out working to work. All right, that issue needs to be dealt with. But that don't mean I still can't manage businesses, though. That doesn't mean I still can't push my legacy, though. It don't matter bankruptcy. It don't matter credit. It don't matter life obstacles, divorce, breakups, whatever it is. You got to have a commitment. You got to have a burning desire to meet those big, bodacious goals. I pour my life out for y'all so I can touch somebody somewhere who might be going through something similar or can at least say that I don't got no excuse. I got to get on my grind. No excuses. Yeah. We all go through it. Just accept that. It ain't going to be easy. Accept that. That's what motivates me when I have my tough weeks. And I really feel like crying. Every time I see my brother right here, every week we go on this tour, he asks me how I'm doing, and I let him know. Ain't no, I'm good. I, I put my head in his shoulder and start talking about all my woes for the week. All my woes. But what motivates me to keep going, though, is... I got momentum right now. My family has momentum right now. I've agreed to be the CEO of my last name, the CEO of my family. And my heirs deserve for me to put my best effort forward to leave them in the best position as possible so that they have the best next step up to leave their heirs, which are my heirs as well, in the best position possible to Reverse something that's been in our family, which is the poverty curse. Mm. That's my goal. My goal is to make as much headway to give her and her sister and any future siblings as much of a head start as I can. Not for Jay to look as good as he can. Not for Jay to have the latest everything that come out that's on the gram. Not for Jay to have the latest bad shoe, bag, car, biggest crib. Our home is modest. I don't got to have the biggest crib right now. It's not my goal. My goal is not to impress you. That's not my goal. My goal is not to be the one who got the biggest this and the biggest that so you feel good about Jay. No, I need them to feel good about our last name. And until we get that kind of mentality and adopt that and get off this competing thing that we do or what I call trying to keep up with the Joneses and our last name ain't Jones. Uh-oh. I don't even get caught up into that. Oh, the new Rolls Royce race truck out. Oh, this truck out. Oh, boy, you gonna get it? You gonna get it? I don't gotta have the new and the latest. Now, mind you, I'll treat myself when I so choose. Strategically, within my overall plan to build family wealth, I'll reward myself along the way. But my life ain't living to keep up with people or to keep up with Joneses or to keep up with, with, with the gram. It's those kind of disciplines and those kind of sacrifices. So here's how our lecture starts today. I need everybody to say, we're going to learn today. We're going to learn today. today. I want y'all to say it again, we're going to learn today. We're going to learn today. All right, so the first thing, again, this is an intergenerational family wealth class. So the first thing we got to do with the people we talk about building wealth and building legacy, we got to understand those big audacious goals, exactly what that goal is. We can't build wealth if we haven't identified wealth. We don't even know what wealth looks like. So I need y'all to help me today. We're going to learn together. What is the definition of wealth? Let's go. It's like a good buck 50 of us out here. 
Abundant assets, we forever straight. <laughs> Financial freedom. Residuals. Ownership. Ownership. Anybody else? Time. All right, here's how we're gonna time. Here's how we're gonna do this. We like the learning groups. So we're gonna take my man. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. My man with the red hat right here. Uh -oh. You ain't got nothing. You got nothing. You got nothing. Oh, right there. Uh -huh. We're gonna use you as the barrier, though. Oh, so okay. everybody on this side of you, this left side, you all going to be one team. Everybody on the right side, on everybody to the back, all you all going to be one team. Y'all going to be my Saints, and y'all going to be my Lou. All right? So I need my Saints to make some noise. All right, Lou, turn up one. Identify wealth. So here's what wealth is. I need my saints to say an abundance of assets. An abundance of assets. Say it again, an abundance of assets. An abundance of assets. I need my Lou to say that supersede liabilities. That supersede liabilities. One more time, Lou, I said in the week. That supersede liabilities. That supersede liabilities. Let me break this down for us real quick. Wealth is an abundance of assets. That supersede liabilities. We'll add a little piece of that. And debt. Liabilities and debt. We'll say debt, that together. So, let's talk about the abundance piece. What does that mean to have an abundance of assets? What the hell does that mean? A lot. How much money you got? A lot. A lot. Unlimited. <laughs> Things that work for you. Overflowing. <laughs> So we're not talking about just you got a few properties, you got a couple of dollars, but it's having an abundance, an overflow, <laughs> overkill, extra, an abundance of assets. So let's talk about what, what are some things that are assets? What are these assets that we must have an abundance of? Real estate. Stocks. Bonds. Somebody said real estate. Stocks. Real estate. Anything that makes you money. Real estate. Products. Stocks. Business. Life insurance. Insurance. Precious metals. Yeah. Crypto. Uh, cryptocurrency. Uh oh. CDs, certificate of deposits. Not music CDs, y'all. Certificates of deposit. CDs. Bonds. Uh oh. Our assets being things that hold. Will have the potential to appreciate in value. value. Everybody say appreciate. 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 Appreciate meaning go up in value. So have an abundance of things that hold value or appreciate in value. <laughs> or can be leveraged to create more value, such as even having cash. So if we have an abundance of assets that appreciate in value, that's our abundance. It needs to supersede our liabilities. What do you mean by supersede? Overcome. Surpass. Surpass. Overcome. Be more than. So we got to have a than. bunch of an extra, an overflow of assets, things of value that overcome, that beat out our liabilities and debt. What are some liabilities? Cars. Cars. Student loan Cars, debt. Clothes. <laughs> student loan debt. Anything that loses value. Bad debt. Rent. Rent. Oh. <laughs> All things we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Pretty much. Jordans. Oh. Our spending habits. So what we say when we talk about building family wealth, what we're saying is. We're committing to do the things that are intentional, on purpose, to start stacking up, racking up, stacking to the side. More assets, things that hold and grow in value, having an abundance of those while we supersede, while we overflow that with our liabilities and our bad debt. So keeping those expenses low, keeping them cars and the liabilities 
Because cars, what? They depreciate in value. As soon as you drive off the lot. As soon as you drive off the lot. Turn the key, Las Vegas. I don't care if it's a new Lamborghini. The day you drive off the lot, and now it's went down in value instantly. So we can have a bunch of those. They look so good and so pretty, but they're not doing a benefit for our heirs. So the first goal for us is to be intentional about having an overflow of assets that overcome our liability and our debt. Then we are on a track to building intergenerational family wealth. So that means that there's going to be some things that we got to do in our lifetime, some purchases that we want to make, some trips that we want to take. I can't do it. Some things that we want to do that might got to get a little pause on them until we met a bigger bodacious goal. See, the looking good goal, that's easy. <laughs> people say, people see somebody drop by a Lamborghini, but man, I want to do what he do. I'm like, he was just a car ballet. <laughs> After all that, huh? <laughs> you chase somebody because of how they looking and not really what the substance is, is the assets, the value. So as we do this, we do this, and the only way it gets done in our families is somebody has to agree in the family to be the CEO. What does CEO mean? Chief Say it again. Chief Executive Officer. One more time, please. Chief Executive Officer. The Chief Executive Officer. Let me break that down for you. I told you, this is a class we could have taught in seventh grade, ninth grade, Sunday school. That's right. The Chief Executive Officer of an organization or the CEO is better defined as the leader and visionary of the organization. The boss. I need my saints to say leader. leader. I need my Lou to say visionary. visionary. I need my saints to say leader. leader. I my Lou to say visionary. visionary. So somebody in the family got to step up. Knowing that we ain't got no family wealth, somebody got to say, all right, man, fine. Something. Um, I got us. Somebody got to step up. Because when everybody for the family scrambling around just doing them for their first name. Who the hell's looking out and being a visionary for us in our last name for the future? So then we look up and everybody on three scream your last name. One, two, three. Oh. Yeah, we look up and that last name is broken 30 years. Because everybody's scrambling, running around trying to think for themselves in their first name. And nobody stepped up to be the old school patriarch or matriarch for our last name saying, you know what, I got us. I got us. I'm going to make sure, I want to ball out right now, but fine. Okay. I'm going to make sure that I make the disciplined decisions as the leader of our last name organization, as the visionary, the one that's looking ahead for our family. I got, I'm going to put us on our, our back and make sure that we straight. One of my protégés, Isaac Grace, who did so well last year, he started with me at 20 years old. He's now 25 years old. He did over three hundred thousand last year with a nine hundred thousand dollar business. Started as a GED graduate, been under my mentorship for five years. And he texted me yesterday. He just closed a deal, made thirty eight thousand. That's right. He sent me his check. He always, you know, screenshot his check. But look, look, big bro. Wholesale deal. And yeah, well, he, no, he ain't more than wholesale. He, he does wholesale strategy. He also develops. He also is a landlord. He has assets. <laughs> See, some people just wholesale. See, wholesale and real estate, I'm explaining, is being a middleman or middlewoman, right. and you're giving everybody the deals, you're making a little check, but everybody got the assets but you. Yep. See, my students know better than that. <laughs> they know to know how to wholesale when they need to, right. but they know to acquire them assets right. and start stacking up wealth. Tell them. Portfolios, residual income, passive income, cash flow, appreciation, equity, tax advantages, tax mitigation, corporate fails. My students know the game. That's right. Right. So he was saying to me yesterday, he said, Big Bro, you like the CEO for our community. Being the leader and big, while we do this class, I'm trying to put our village on the game of what I've learned over the last 15 years from working with some of the wealthiest families on the East Coast, some of the most successful business advisors and consultants in my organization. I'm just translating back to us all I learned coming from the same block. This is the game they're playing. They, the they that we, we always talk about, this is the game that they are playing out there. Mm. They're playing a the family wealth game. Yep. 
Somebody steps up and says, I got us. Then they start making plays for the family on how we start to build wealth and making some hard, disciplined decisions. So, who here today is committed to being that person for their last name? Me! Yes. Now, you just made a big commitment right now. Don't back down later. You made either. a big commitment right now. That means you want to make some tough decisions as the CEO, Chief Executive Officer for, say your last name again, yes. for that last name. You have to lead them, and in order to lead them, you got to be prepared to damn self. An uninformed or uneducated executive, an uninformed or uneducated leader is not a good leader at all. You're going to lead them to doom if you yourself don't know the game. So we understand the first part of wealth and now the importance of leadership and legacy. Now we're going to talk about the legacy piece. Again, this is the intergenerational family wealth class. Now when it comes to legacy, somebody tell what legacy means, please. For your family. We can't keep hashtagging Black Wall Street and Black Money Matters and Black Lives Matters and buy back the block. <laughs> we don't know what legacy is. Right. What you leave behind? What you leave behind? Anyone else? Setting up your heirs. Next Setting up your heirs? Next generation. All right. This is what we're here for. We're going to learn today. Legacy. It's the amount of assets and money one leaves behind for their heirs. That's legacy. So we're talking about building intergenerational family wealth, we're talking about building legacy. So I need my saints to say, the amount of assets, the amount of assets. my Luna say, and money, and money. I need everybody to say, one leaves behind, one leaves behind, for their heirs. For their heirs. Yo, if we ain't focused on that, we're going to always lose. We're going to always be in last place. What motivated me to start educating you and doing these classes is because our community, our village, has been in last place when it comes to family wealth in this country. For we've been in the last place for 450 years, every single year on year. Wow. I read that in 2012. And I'm like, wait, so if I know all this information, if I'm beginning to build wealth, what can I do to catch the rest of the village up? Because what's the point of me being an all-star player on a losing team? That's right. So we've been in last place for every year, for over 450 years, every single year, in the family wealth statistics. We've been in last place, I say, as a CEO type and leader type and visionary type, I'm going to do whatever I can do to do something about it. Whether that's innovating a street class, whether that's creating an online school, whether it's college lectures, whether it's my inmate the real estate program, whether it's writing books, whether it's starting a fund, if you look at every single one of my business models, they are social entrepreneur business models. In every business that I manage or operate, it has some kind of social impact, as well as being able to turn a profit, because a business should. That's the win-win. Win-win situation. Fair exchange, no robbery. But my point is, while I'm pouring into you all, this is the appetizer. We're going to get into the class. It's the appetizer. But I need us to understand that this is just bigger than the short game we've been playing. We're playing the short game, the right now game. This is the right later game. Mm -hmm. This is the long ball game. So we're here to build legacy through building wealth and leaving assets in abundance for our heirs. Because they deserve so. And because we know the challenges we had growing up. And I think we would appreciate it if someone had the opportunity to do and give us a better head start than many of us had. Right. And if you had a great head start, it's your obligation to make it a greater head start. That's right. Regardless. So, 
We talked about wealth. We talked about building assets, leaving a legacy. And now let's talk about to how we get that accomplished. See, what we believe in the J. Morrison Academy, and I want to tell you guys, tomorrow at 10 a.m., we have a nice crowd today, at 10 a.m., indoors, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we fly all over the country, no matter how jet lag we feel, we get up early in the morning to make it to our 10 a.m. class to pour into you and teach you. Tomorrow's a class where it's for mothers and fathers and families. All children are free, under 18. The class is only a $47 class. This ain't no $300 class, although it's $3,000 game and information. That's right. But tomorrow, I'm going to teach you and show you all, Will and I, how to boost your credit score, how to leverage your credit or non-credit to do no money down deals, and most importantly, I want to show you all how to start and begin to acquire what we call anchor properties or apartment buildings. Every father, every family deserves to have an apartment building under their portfolio, under their belt. And it's not even that hard that you think it is. No one just told you yet, or you didn't focus to go sit down and learn it. Now you got the opportunity. For tomorrow, I'm going to give you the beginning game on how to acquire apartment buildings, no money down. No fluff, real food. At 10 a.m., let's see who shows up. Simple as that, let's see who shows up. Right and early. This is the same game that my mentor taught word? me, charges $30,000 for a weekend to give you the same game, give you $47. Tomorrow, we call it our million air class. Air, H E I R. This is to prepare you for your heirs to leave those assets. So, what we believe in the J. Morrison Academy, we believe in this fundamental education for building wealth called the RBCs. What's RBC stand for? Anybody know? Real estate, business, and credit. Everybody say real estate? Real estate. Everybody say business. Business. And everybody say credit. Credit. What we mean by that is, in the English language, we all learned in schools the fundamentals of the ABCs. The ABCs is how we put words together. How we put words together, how we put sentences together, how we put paragraphs together, how we communicate, how we learn, how we read. It's the fundamentals for how we become intellectual are the ABCs. The fundamentals for how you begin to build family wealth is having a proficient knowledge, an efficient knowledge, being informed on real estate, business, and credit. There are multiple streams of ways to build wealth. I believe in life insurance as well. I believe in diverse portfolios and stocks and bonds and understanding all that. But before you even get burdened down <laughs> with all the sophistication to build a family wealth, the most basic thing that we all can do is understand the fundamentals of real estate, business, and credit. Everybody say RBCs. RBCs. Let me tell you why. We start with real estate. While real estate is one of the main business principles, practices, assets that we need to get more familiar with, is because real estate runs the world. This corner we're at right now is what? Real estate. Real estate. If we did it across the street in the park, what was that? Real estate. If we did it downtown at the hotel, what was that? Real estate. If we did it at the community center, what was that? Real estate. At the local high school, what was that? Real estate. The hospital you were born in was what? Oh, police. Everywhere. We do this survey every class. It's never our intention to embarrass nobody because we all family. We love y'all. We ain't trying to embarrass nobody. But I want everybody to be honest. I want everybody to be honest. By show of hands right now, who here lives somewhere? Everybody. <laughs> be honest. <laughs> this is why real estate has all the power. <laughs> Every product that we have in our hands, that phone you got in your hand, that plastic it was made from, came from plants. Plants came from what? Real estate. Land, real estate. <laughs> every metal, every gold, the paper, 
Everything that we have in touch, the earth is one big bowl of real estate. Whoever owns the most land wins. Whoever knows how to own the most land wins. Lord of your land. We haven't even gone past that part, the how-to. So we can't even acquire. So one of the first books is right now, 10% of the American population own 88% of all the real estate. Whoa. 10% of the American population own 88% of the real estate. That means the other 90% are the customers to the 10%. They are the tenants, the customers. Why we know real estate makes the most sense for our families and why you have to be intentional to learn it, all we're doing at the J. Morris Academy is giving you the relatable, translatable curriculum for you to be able to learn this in the easiest of ways and learn it for people that have done it in real life at the highest level. Why we know this makes sense is because I can draw a house here. This house can be a building, it can be a hotel, it can be an apartment complex. But why real estate makes the most sense for us is because by owning real estate, even starting with the roof over your head, I got a book there called Lord of My Land, Five Steps to Home Ownership. You want to know how to buy your first house? I spell it out in five simple steps. Fighting the fear, getting pre-approved, evaluating your deal, putting in your offer, closing your deal, managing your deal. But why this makes so much sense is because over time, just by living somewhere, I'm not talking about HDTV flip this house. I'm talking about over time, just by living somewhere, properties over time, because of supply and demand, appreciate in value. That appreciation then creates what's called equity. Equity is, for those taking notes, equity is the difference between what you owe on a property and what it's, and worth. What it's worth. If you owe zero on a property and it's worth two hundred thousand, you got two hundred thousand equity. If you owe the bank or a mortgage company, a private lender, or a grant, if you owe a hundred thousand on a property, it's worth two hundred thousand. You have a hundred thousand in equity. Equity is the difference between what you owe on a property and what it's worth. That equity though is real value for you to be able to tap into later, leverage, and leverage it through refinances, home equity lines of credit, home equity loans. You can tap into this equity tax-free and then use this equity to go buy more real estate and more assets. Now that's smart. All by just doing what you were doing anyway and living somewhere. Outside of that equity and a property and appreciation, if you begin to rent the properties, you buy a multifamily, four family, two family, or a single family then move out to another unit. You can keep that single family or multifamily and begin to get Passive income or rental income. You can live in one unit, rent the other three out, live for free, or get paid while you live and while it appreciates in value. And you get what we call rental income and cash flow. Passive income, residual income. These are all the assets we're talking about. The abundance is coming. Step by step. Then on top of the cash flow, the equity, the appreciation, by owning a real estate asset, you then have power and control. You own the air rights above the real estate, the right to build up on the asset and create more units. You own the mineral rights below the real estate and the land around it. And the oil in the ground. Huh? And the gold. And everything. The right to rent your lot out for parking, the right to farm on it, the right to dig on it. So by owning the real estate, the land, you got the power and control, the air rights, the mineral rights, the equity, appreciation, the cash flow, residual income. And then, if that wasn't good enough, uh -oh. if that wasn't good enough, you then have many, many, many tax, tax advantages benefits. from owning real estate.
You can write off certain closing costs when you close your deal. The interest on your mortgage you can write off at times. You can depreciate the whole value of the asset over 27 and a half years. You can depreciate all the personal tangible property in the asset. Anything that you take off with a screwdriver or a hammer in a full-time investment property, you can depreciate from your earned income. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if you made 70000 this year, but you owned a real estate asset, and all the value of the personal tangible property inside the cabinets, the hot water heater, the boilers, the sinks, the doors, if all those things were worth 20000 and you made 70000 this year, you can write, take that depreciation off your earned income of 70000 and now instead of paying taxes on 70000 you're paying taxes on 50000 now. Therefore, retaining more cash and money for your heirs. All through Real one estate. vehicle, and we all agree we had to live somewhere anyway. And I know here in St. Louis, you guys have innovative aldermen and councilmen and wardmen and whatever y'all call them here. Alderman. Alderman, right. I said it. But you have folks that are implementing po programs and policies for dollar properties and other kinds of opportunities to get into real estate assets. But then we're not intentional about learning how to put ourselves in position. Everybody say in position. In position. That's all it boils down to. Preparation plus opportunity equals success. If you don't put yourself in position because you're informed, you will have opportunities fly by you that could have been Wealth and legacy and assets and abundance for your heirs, but it flew by you because you ain't know no better. Because you don't know enough about enough. You don't know how to evaluate a good deal when you do see it. Because you're not putting yourself in position. So we know that real estate makes sense from these perspectives plus more. Then we get into the how can we on real estate. So how can I buy? Well, first and foremost, from anyone that's looking to live or move in a single family, condo, townhouse, or anything what we call one to four units, which is considered residential real estate. Residential. Matter of fact, even one to four units with a store attached. Cool. If that store, those store units are less than a four units, it's called mixed-use residential real estate, or residential mixed-use. You can buy anything one to four units, even one to four units with a store, for as little as 3% down. 3% down payment. That means 3000 down for every $100,000 house. 6000 down for a $200,000 house. Even four units, four units with a store. Huh. Nine grand down for a $300,000 house. You can buy with 3% down. I'm going to go back to our other chart real quick. I want to show you something. I want you all to look at this. Don't look at it like, okay, Jay speaking some game. He gave us a lecture, but somebody's talking at me, talking to me. I want you to look at it as I'm showing you that if we don't put ourselves in a position that we own, this is what happens. You end up being a lifelong tenant, a lifelong customer, and now, after 12 years of renting, <laughs> you gave your cash flow to somebody else's last name, somebody else's family. You created equity for somebody else's family in their last name and their abundance. You gave somebody else's family tax advantages. You gave somebody else power and control, air rights and mineral rights, all off of your back. Oh. Look at it that way. And in a time and place to rent. But you should always put yourself in a position to, as often as you can, own and control. Because if you don't, answer this question for me, please. If you own, if you rented a property for 30 years, how much money do you get back at the end? Zero. None. But what you rent it for 70 years? How much money do you get back at the end? None. No matter how good you take care of the property, how good you mow the lawn, Y'all feel like it's your house? If you don't really own the property, all you did over those years was pay somebody's 30-year mortgage off. You paid their whole mortgage down from 80 grand down to zero. Good job. 
And now they got all the equity to tap into to use for a future asset. They got all the benefits of cash flow off your back because you are intentional. That should piss you off. That should motivate you. Because you simply could have lived somewhere anyway. That's all you did was live somewhere anyway, pay this down for 30 years, and one day when you go, your heirs at least have one asset, some equity, and a roof over their head to inherit. That's the least you could have gave them. Look at it that way. So we talked about 3% down. Another strategy for buying homes, and mind you, this is the beginner's class. Y'all want the advanced class? 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. That's right. I will give you the camera I'll lay down the platter. No, I didn't. Outside 3% down, you can have multiple co-borrowers when applying for a mortgage. Meaning, if you say money's your problem, it don't all gotta be on you. We talking about family legacy. Get with your family, get together. You got three folks that's renting and saying, let's make a strategic plan to be co-borrowers on a loan together and put ourselves in position for some family wealth. You can have two foot people, three, four, five, six borrowers on one loan application. Mm. Pulling your money together, pulling your assets together to put you down. Mind you, is it a, is it a forever plan? No. But is it a stepping stone? Is it a chess move? Maybe. Outside of multiple co-borrowers and 3% down, you also can use the future rental income to qualify for a mortgage. Performa. Meaning, if you're living in one unit, you're buying a multifamily, but you don't financially qualify on paper, the banks will take a percentage of your future rental income, between 70 and 90%, depending on the bank. So let's say you're getting 1,000 for these units, or 3,000 a month, and you're living in one unit, or 36,000 a year, the bank will give you, on that $36,000 a year, they'll give you just say 70% of a future rental credit. Meaning, if you make $25,000 a year at your job, the banks will take 70% of the $36,000 that your rental income would bring you in the future, and they'll say, we'll add another $25,200 towards your actual income to qualify you. Mm. So now the bank sees you as making 50200 a year as opposed to your normal 25000 Calculating the future rental income you might make. <laughs> Put you in a position to be a landlord, which we call lord of your land. So now 25 going to one of my multifamilies that have four acres of land with it. I was getting out and one of my tenant's children, I'm hopping out, I'm on some just young boy stuff, 25, got my fitted hat on, my sweats on, come from the gym. I'm just going to check out my property. But the children, this woman's like twice my age. Her children's like, the landlord's here, the landlord's here. I'm like, oh shit, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what they talking about. Like, they scramble, I'm coming, they scrambling. Landlord's here. And it really dawned on me that day. That's not just I'm the landlord, I'm the lord of the land. I'm the big homie. I'm the shot caller. And that's something that all our families deserve and enjoy. Imagine pulling up to your 98 units, your 330 units, your 8 units, your 12 units. And that's yours. That's your family. That's your last name. Feels great. I gave my heir, my daughter, an assignment to go to our 28 units of student housing and to do an assessment for me. I want you to go through, as a college student, I want you to go through our student housing, and I want you to tell me what can we improve in our student housing so other people's kids are living like we would want them to live. I want you to interview our tenants, our students, and our student housing. But imagine giving your children, your heirs, those experiences to go check up on your apartment building. What kind of seeds does that plant for them? God know me growing up, i never seen myself or us in that position. We was the ones scrambling at the landlords here. <laughs> that was us. But, oh, he's pulling up. But we got the power, what I'm trying to say, we got the power to put our families in that same position. 
But it's a matter of where we focus and be intentional about it. Or do the nightlife mean more? Do the bottles of sparkles mean more? Do the vacations mean more? No. Do the Valentine's Day mean more? Do the birthdays mean more? We'll complain about our situation when we ain't got the money to do this, but your kids ain't missed a birthday yet. Uh, right. You ain't missed a Christmas yet. You ain't missed a Valentine's Day yet. You ain't missed a vacation yet. But you ain't got no assets to leave behind for your heirs. Uh. You gotta ask yourself, yo, if I died today, God forbid, if God took me today, you gotta go back to my kings, my men. You gotta ask yourself, yo, if one of these young boys wild out today, if something happens to me today, what have I left behind for my family to be better than when I came? I call this lesson the baller starter kit. How dare you go out bowling out, buying cars and $700 belts and all of that as a grown man. You got a closet full of designer shoes and designer this and Red bottoms. You know, least payment out of this world. You got life insurance on your car and your phone, but you ain't got a life insurance on your life. You got life insurance on everything else. A phone. But you ain't got life insurance on your life. Crazy. The ball of starter kids, yo, before you ball out, everybody, men, women, kings, queens, before you ball out, first and foremost, you need to be operating, this a B right there, off a family budget. First and foremost, you should know your money well. Yep. If you don't know what you spent last month, what you spent last quarter, the last three months, the last year, you 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 losing that your job. You're a poor CEO. Fire yourself. Huh. What kind of CEO what kind of money come in and out the organization? Oh, I'm going to just spend it. I'm going to get it back. You don't even know what you spent to know what to get back. Or what the opportunity cost of that money could have been for your heirs. Next part of the ball starter kit. Outside of having your budget, you need to focus on getting that life insurance policy. Go sit down with somebody. I got a bunch of game on this. I ain't gonna go down that rabbit hole right now, but I'm gonna tell you. Something happened to me, mine gonna be straight. Go get in the game. Figure it out. I don't care if you got a quarter million dollar policy. It costs you 40, 50, 60, 70 bucks a month. But you'll get an eighth of weed every week, though. Mm. Well, you died in there, your heirs going there. What, they're going to smoke your bag up? <laughs> you going to leave your heirs your loud pack? Not focused. That ain't they fault. That's your fault. Outside of your budget and your life insurance. Listen, you got to own some type of real estate asset. You got to. Got to. That's the... This land all over the country, $1,000 for an acre, $2,000 for an acre, $5,000 for an acre. Go buy a house, sit on it. Same money you're spending on frivolous stuff. Go own an asset for your family. Go own something substantial to leave behind. Then we get into, if you can, you should have some types of stocks or businesses. Either a business you run, a business you invest in, franchise, or some shares of a business through stocks. This is the basics. Before you go bowling out, cover the foundation first. Take your home base first. Make sure they're straight. So this is my little mini lesson on my, on my baller starter kit. It's know your money. Put some in case on your life. Easily put yourself in this for a real estate asset. All stocks and businesses. And lastly, not yourself, but invest in your credit. And I'm going to say what we call, and I'm going to explain to you in a second, your credit <laughs> and cash ecosystem. I'm going to break it down for you in a minute. 
We spend so much money on frivolous things. Again, we talk about the RBCs. I'm giving you all the minimum of what you gotta learn about real estate, business, and credit to put your family in position. So on the real estate side, I'm showing you there's multiple ways to buy your first home, first multifamily, the benefits of owning that home or real estate asset. We can get into what we'll cover a little bit tomorrow. The multiple strategies we talked about earlier of wholesaling real estate. This is so simple, so basic, I don't even waste my time. It is simple. It's simply positioning yourself, understanding how to market for, for discounted properties, contracting those properties, so you have what's called the purchase rights of the properties, and then selling off your purchase rights to somebody else with more money than you, or who wants the property, and you make a fee in between by selling or signing your contract. Very simple. Basically. You can get into properties, and again, buy low, Sell high. It's called flipping real estate. In order to do it effectively, you got need to know how to find the real estate, how to have the proper company structure so you're protecting yourself in your deal, understand how to evaluate the actual opportunity, what's the purchase price, what's my all-in cost, my carrying cost, what's the ARV or after repair value, how do I find that value, and you got to know how to be able to build a team so your contractors, your realtors, your title agents, your attorneys don't get over on you. Mm -hmm. I'll teach you all of that on a platter. But you can buy low, sell high. You can get into real estate and say, you know what? I don't want to flip it. I don't want to get rid of it. I don't want to wholesale and middleman it. I want to hold it, holding real estate. And I want to receive the rental income from these units or the cash flow. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about at 10 a.m. apartment buildings. The big assets, and then ways to take these apartments and units down, no money down. Mm. What we call syndicating real estate. I'll put our community on game. I'm going to give you the game. So the more you know about this, you could drive by your community and see one of these and understand the questions you've got to ask, who you need on your team, to even evaluate this stuff as a good opportunity. If we can't do that, if you don't understand the prices, if you don't understand the going rate, if you don't understand how to evaluate these assets, we can't never acquire the assets. Not intelligently, not strategically, not in from an informed perspective. So I'm trying to okay. So we have these real estate strategies and much, much more goes deep, y'all. But the dope part about it, what I'm trying to tell you all from someone that's... I was thinking about the other day, I was like, man, I've seen a lot of millions. <laughs> but I ain't saying, I'm like, I was actually like, proud of myself. I'm like, damn, bro, you actually did it. <laughs> like, you really seem like M's come to your account, like, off the, like, off the, I'm like, I was scraping the plate. This ain't come easy. So I was broke at 30, like preparing for bankruptcy, like broke, broke, <laughs> like no car broke, like borrow money from my mom broke as a grown man, after being a millionaire, first time, I'm double back on him. <laughs> Do it all over again. Double back on him, I'm like, yo. And what I'm trying to say is that I'm telling y'all it could be done, I know how to do it. But how I'd be able to put myself in position is because I could look at any real estate asset in any city, in any community, and evaluate it in a matter of minutes. That's how you gotta be. I know the game. And when I talked about that credit piece, here's why the credit piece is so important when we talk about the RBCs. And tomorrow we're gonna really dive in on businesses. One of the biggest things, when we say RBCs, real estate business, well, we look at real estate as a business. But we understand how owning our own business, how we can leverage that through so many different ways, again, to continue to create wealth for our families. But I want to talk about the credit piece real quick and what Will and I have established over the last few years. That credit and cash ecosystem, everybody should be investing in this. Because this is really where I cracked the wealth code. So this is probably one of this 
And I got one more lesson that I gotta give you. Actually, I'm gonna say this for last. I'm gonna come back. I want to give you this perspective when it comes to business and our money and investing. If we're going to do business together, or you're going to do business for your heirs, we got to understand this lesson, what we call opportunity cost of money. What opportunity cost is, is this. This is what everybody got to know. These are the most critical lessons I need you to focus in on for. If you got a hundred thousand, ten thousand, or a million dollars, I don't think you got a thousand dollars or ten million. We gotta understand with money, everyone got the same problem. That's where can I park my money to where it can make me more money than where it's currently at. Not the bank. So you and the wealthy person have the same problem. If you got ten thousand in cash or a hundred thousand or a million, that cash is earning you zero percent return on your investment. Or 0% ROI a year. Cash is sitting there. It's dead. Actually, it loses you 3% a year because the cost of living goes up 3% because of the inflation rate. Yep, inflation. Cash is sitting there. So you put that cash to a checking account, that checking account will get you maybe 0.001%. You're talking about 10% of $10,000 is $100. 1% is $10. Huh. One tenth of percent is a dollar. Point zero zero one percent. You're talking about ten cents or a penny on your money over the course of a year in a checking account. That's correct. That three grand, that one grand, that ten grand, your checking account right now. It's dead. That's your banker. How much interest am I earning on this money over the year? What's my rate? Then you wise up. You might put it in a certificate of deposit or a CD or a savings account. And you got to tie that up for two or three years and maybe get you 2%. So now you're making 200 on 10,000, 2,000 on 100,000, or 20,000 on a million. You might wise up, you got that IRA, that 401k, that 403b, that pension account. The pension might be earning you a whopping 4 or 5%. <laughs> whopping. So now you're making 500 on 10,000. 5,000 or 100,000 or 50,000 on a million. So the question we got to ask ourselves are two lessons out of this. And why I said being informed is how you start building wealth. It's for those caught in that corporate trap and you got that 401k, that pension account, those caught in that cash trap or anywhere in between, you got to ask yourself, even if my money was earning me 5% or, or $5,000 a year on 100,000, do I have enough capacity, wherewithal, strategy? Can I take my same hundred thousand that's sitting in my four hundred one k or four hundred three b, transfer it to a self directed IRA to a checkbook LLC, and can I make more than five thousand a year of my hundred thousand dollars? Definitely. We think we can, but are we really in position? Do we know how to evaluate a business? Do we know how to onboard staff? Do we got to create our company, brand our company, get our EIN for our company, our done number for our company? I know how to do that. Do we know how to do our proper invoices, our offboarding, evaluating our deals? See, we always say we got a money problem, but if we can throw a bag in your lap right now, you're going to fumble it. It's gone. <laughs> so understanding this is not just about us and what we can do with the money. The lesson I'm going to teach you tomorrow, though, is that there's private partners all throughout the world who have the same problem, who are wealthy, who are looking for opportunities to invest their money, and are looking for people to invest their money with. So it's not just about you and where your capital is sitting, but for those who are saying they got a cash problem, I'm going to teach you tomorrow at 10 a.m. how to use this opportunity zone strategy to find cash partners all throughout the country and throughout the world who will fund your deals if you can prove your deals are a better place to park their money than where it's currently at. That's the opportunity cost game. And the game they're playing out there. So when we come to the credit piece, why this credit piece is so important? This is 
where we truly crack the wealth code. I'm giving everybody, like, we got to run with this game. When it comes to the credit piece, 